Thanks very much, Dennis. Um, yeah, we got to get rid of at least one viable people uh, at the moment. I don't see smoke coming out, out of anyone's ears except Dennis's, so we're going to go right to the next speaker. Um, and that's Terry Brent. You're going to come up and do this, right? Because I don't, I'm not in the union. Um, Terry's going to talk about the building envelope. Just one comment. Um, Dennis described natural ventilation as a fad. So I wonder how many centuries does it take for something to stop being a fad? <laughs> and we'll, we'll save that for the discussion. For, yeah. So. <laughs> I'm not going to spend time introducing Dennis to Terry either because uh, Dennis was going to do that, but he ran out of time. So. <laughs> You'll introduce yourself and I, I, I will. Hi, I, I'm, I'm Terry Brennan. This is my talk. This is my short-term memory. <laughs> Anyone else like that? It's safe. You can raise your hand. <laughs> no, you're too young for this. <laughs> um, Thanks for having me here. David, David, thanks for having me here. Committee, thanks for having me here. Um, micro IOMs. Did you notice that IOM is part of the word? Coincidence? <laughs> you decide. <laughs> I think not. <laughs> just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water. Um, <laughs> good enclosure, bad enclosure, and the accidentally invited. We, we make buildings with places in them that just say home to critters of all kinds. We might as well put out little signs that say, bring the family. So. Ooh, all right. Um, I, I thought I'd begin with these guys put together a handout, and, and I sent them stuff, and they put it in there. And these are the things they, they put in. They put in um, at least part of the EPA Moisture Control Guide for Commercial Insti inst Institutional Buildings. They put in Section 1 on moisture dynamics and fundamentals. Um, also in there is moisture control for residential buildings. And by commercial and institutional and residential, and that with that division, what I'm essentially saying is the residential stuff is frame, wood-framed buildings, largely. And the commercial stuff is non-combustible materials. That's sort of the major difference between those two construction types. The systems are quite different in many ways. Um, planned, unplanned airflows in moisture problems is an, an article that uh, myself, Jim Cummings, and uh, Joe Stieberg wrote for the Ashtray Journal some amount of time ago that I can't remember, <laughs> like 2007 or something. Does that sound right? Um, and at the bottom, at the end of the, the handout, I, I have a, a, a paper that I wrote for an ACGIH, which is the American Conference of um, Governmental Industrial Hygienes, uh, a, a fun group at a party. And <laughs> it's called Moisture Focused Mold Investigations, where I outlined that, you know, the way to find mold is to go into a building, and if you already know where buildings get wet most of the time, go look in the wet places, and if you don't find mold there, probably not mold in the building, or not any problem mold anyway. So I thought it might be useful for you guys because it's kind of a list of where buildings get wet. Next. Yeah, there we go. Ah. 
You're tuned in to WH2O, Easy Listening, Building Science Radio. <laughs> I'd like you to imagine the place where you live. Inside, you have, well, outside. What's it doing on the coldest day of the year where you live? How cold is that? Re re well, you're from Colorado. It's really effing cold. <laughs> and dry. Really, really dry. How about... About the same as this room. <laughs> uh, you're from California. You know, you know, Hal, California, that is not a climate that builds character. You know that, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. And it dehumidifies, too. Uh, how cold? What do you think? Where you live, the coldest day? 10 degrees. Zero. Oh, God. <laughs> I, I, I'm from near Syracuse. I'm almost a Canadian, eh? So minus 20, minus 30, that that kind of that kind of thing. How about now? I want you to imagine the warmest day of the year. How hot is it? Really hot. 95. 105. But no humidity, right? There's no humidity in my oven, you know that, right? <laughs> Just letting you know, 105 is still really hot. <laughs> uh, so how many people live in a climate where all you need is a heating system? Uh, yeah, all right. Let the record show two people raise their hands. How many people live in a climate where all you need is an air conditioning system? Let the record show no one raised their hand. How many people never raise your hands when I ask these questions? <laughs> I have to subtract you guys out. You're the baseline. That's the control group. Um, how many people live in a place where you have a heating system and a cooling system? Let the record show almost everybody raised their hands because most of the continental United States is heating and cooling systems. That's what we need. That means something to the building enclosure because that means, I mean, how many days of the year do you just open all the windows because it's so wonderful outside? Who's thinking three? Two months. Who will give me three? Three months, three months. Uh, four, who will give me four? Four? Nine months, where do you live? Oh, hell. I, I already ruled them out, that climate, spring and fall. So now, what that means is that all the rest of the time, months and months and months, outdoors is a different climate than indoors. So indoors, we want a dry Mediterranean climate. We love that climate. We love it so much, we invented buildings so that we can <laughs> take it to any godforsaken place on the planet. That's why we have buildings, to transport a dry Mediterranean climate everywhere. Huh? And and, well, <laughs> well and, and past and neighbors and, you know, the secret police. The, so this is an outdoor air, or this is an outdoor wall that separates us from outdoors. Outdoors, it's Washington, D.C. in June. It's hot and it's humid. Indoors, how many people are, are uncomfortably cool right now? Oh. How many people are uncomfortably warm right now? No, no one. <laughs> how many people are just right? All right, so <laughs> in, inside here, it's seventy-one degrees. So, for pe a bunch of people to feel uncomfortably cool, that's about right for sedentary adults, right? And 
Who could guess at the relative humidity? I got 60. I got 60. Well, give me 65. Well, give me 65. How about 50? Who says? 45. 50. Anyone go for 25? Uh, 49. That, that's pretty good. We're, we're pretty good at guessing when it's less than 25. We know it's dry because our lips dry out. We're pretty good at guessing when it's over 70 because it starts to feel like it's hard to breathe. We're starting to sweat. But in the middle, we're usually pretty bad guessers at relative humidity. We don't have the sensors for it. So in here, dry Mediterranean climate. Out there, nasty, humid, D.C. How thick is the wall? In that distance, we have a climatic transition zone. And we pass through intermediate states as you pass through the enclosure. And where the boundaries are inside the wall depend on the insulating value of the materials, the layers of materials, and the vapor permeability, the water. How easy does water vapor pass through the material by diffusion? So like fiberglass insulation, light, fluffy, lots of airspace, water vapor blows right through it. Plastic film, sheet of steel, water vapor, very hard for it to get through. Very, it has to do an end run. It has to go where the leaks are. Does that make sense to folks? Where is it going to condense? A cold surface, surface below the dew point. What cools off a surface? Cold outdoor temperature, cold indoor temperature. So it's either it's cold outside or we're cooling it inside by the air conditioner or because we're below grade. Those are the sources of chilp. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, there, there's no such thing as chilp, but it, it's an imaginary concept like water activity. It's a useful concept, but I can't measure it. No one can measure it. I, I measure headspace relative humidity at a surface. Jeff will tell you about that, right, Jeff? All right, so a few words about the occupants of buildings. Um, anyone ever read Florence Hollis's classic book on social casework? No, seriously, the, life is short. You, you, Get, 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 get a move on. You gotta <laughs> Florence said, start where the client's at. It turns out that th these wise words apply to more fields than social casework. This is my sister-in-law. She's allergic to cats. That's her cat. I wouldn't want to change that about her. I <laughs> really, would you want to change that? Uh, I've heard this attributed to um, uh, Sigmund Freud and also to um, his student, uh, the mythology guy. Oh, Carl Jung. Intellect is a fly speck on the sea of emotion. Based just on my own life, I believe that they were a bit over optimistic on behalf of intellect. I, I lay a veneer of logic over my emotional decisions. That's what I do. Um, would you want to change that about us? Uh, the, the woman who became my life, the first time I saw her, I thought, she looks like trouble. Let me add her. <laughs> Who'd want to change that? Come on. <laughs> <clears throat> occupants. I, I call this post-construction engineering. <laughs> so they, they decided to put a storm door on. And it turned out that the storm door actually couldn't be opened past the beam, the carrying beam, that carry the rafters on the porch roof. After a moment's thought, the conversation went like, Louise, get the chisel.
occupants are very resourceful and crazy as loons. You know, you could actually call facilities if you have a problem like this and they might actually fix it. Dennis, what do you think? <laughs> I know, it works every time. <laughs> uh, you, you see on the wall a thermostat. It's not a thermostat with bright, cheery numbers and a little dial that you can set. <laughs> it's it's a, a sensor that's connected to a, a, a digital control system which has absolutely no empathy for whether you're warm or cold. So the folks in occupying this office thought, we don't get enough air conditioning down here as opposed to this room. And so what we're going to do is we're going to buy a squag light, permanently install it so that when we need more air conditioning, we can turn the light on and swing it over to heat up the thermostat, man. What do you think? Brennan's law of occupant behavior. There's no system that we can design that's so thoroughly thought through or well implemented that a determined or simply unlucky occupant can't overcome it. So outside we have weather, the first uh, chaotic system studied, and inside we have occupants who are insane. If we could keep people out of buildings, we could make them work. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> and anyone in facilities knows that's the truth, and every design architectural engineer knows that's the truth. <laughs> if it weren't for the people, we could make these things work. I took this photograph in a custodial closet on the top floor of, of, of Troy City, City Hall, which thank God was torn down. <laughs> and all the materials in the building heaved a sigh of relief that they were no longer embarrassed at being part of the Troy City Hall. It, <laughs> the reason, of course, I'm in it is because it's a, a failed building enclosure. In many ways, it failed on the drawing board. So, but why would you leave the water running because it's cold out? The pipes freeze <laughs> inside the building. <laughs> Leave the water running. This is not a green building. <laughs> All right, so um, four hydrothermal functions. And by hydrothermal function, I mean that we have to keep the rain out of buildings. And we do that with an umbrella, the cladding and the roofing system that sheds the rain. And inside, underneath our umbrella, we're wearing a raincoat. And that's the building paper or the drainage plane or the water resistant barrier. And we would like to manage that rainwater. We'd like to drain it down and away from the building. And we like to drain it around, away from openings, penetrations through the building with flashing. Here's the way flashing works. Good flashing, bad flashing. You don't tuck your raincoat into your rain pants. Don't tuck your rain pants into your boots. You now know more about flashing than the bulk of the design community. So <clears throat> we have to manage the flow of heat because you want to keep the surfaces warm enough to avoid condensation. That's what we do with insulation. So we have a layer of insulation. We have a raincoat. And the raincoat may be breathable. It may be Gore-Tex or it may be rubber. And we're not going to talk about that anymore today, if that's OK. Um, condensation. We'd like to avoid condensation by the managing the temperature of the surfaces that are vapor impermeable so that they're always above the dew point regardless of whether it's in heating mode or cooling mode because the cold place swaps with the warm humid place when you switch from heating to cooling mode. So your enclosure has to manage condensation in both directions 
And lastly, we need it to be airtight because air carries heat and water with it, and it will just do an end run around your other materials if it's not airtight and cause problems. Is that good? And all this stuff is well laid out in the handout. You can study it at your leisure when you're having trouble sleeping. Um, so what's so hard about getting an enclosure that does this? Uh, the process by which we design and construct buildings is insane in many, many ways. It involves many, many parties, all of them who like to do things the way they have always done them. And things have changed over the years. So we don't... We don't <laughs> Anybody been involved in the design charrette? <laughs> yeah, what do you think? Which figure do you most relate to? <laughs> I'm usually the guy being choked. <laughs> Jeff, which one, who do you relate to most in that image? <laughs> There's not enough wrestlers. There's not enough wrestlers, right? <laughs> Vivian, you're the referee, aren't you, in these? I, I know you. I know you're the referee in these things. You're like, come on, can't we all get along? <laughs> all right, so here's, here's the trick. The trick when you're designing new and the trick when you're trying to figure out why a building is failing is the engineered solutions to the problems of rainwater leaks, condensation, and air leakage. You can trace from the middle of the building to the middle of the foundation without lifting your blue pen from the pa paper the capillary braid, the raincoat, the roofing material, the tar paper. You can trace it all the way around and if you have to lift your pen you have a weakness in your rainwater control. You can do the same thing with the insulation layer. You can do the same thing with the air barrier. Sometimes one material is the air barrier and the drainage plane. Sometimes one material is the insulation, the air barrier, and the drainage plane. This is a uh, building that uh, I worked on with Chris Benedict and Henry Gifford in Manhattan. It's low income housing. It was built for the same cost per square foot as the crap. And you will see that it has a brick veneer, an air gap with, that allows air to, or water to drain down the back side of the brick. That see, any water that seeps through the brick can drain down and out of the building. It's a big enough air gap so that there's airflow ventilating that space. Uh, we have four inches of high density mineral insulation. We have structural concrete block uh, holding walls, holding up the uh, floors and the roof. And this is a, uh, um, this is, we did this in 2002. This is um, a Portland cement-based damp proofing that is vapor permeable, allows water vapor to pass through, um, but it is liquid water impermeable. It doesn't allow liquid water to wick through it. And it has uh, a latex binder in an, uh, 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 an acrylic binder to give it a little bit of flexibility. So that provides, that makes an air barrier and a drainage plane. And you can see we're wrapping a peel and stick membrane into the window openings and the windows fastened through the jams into the CMU. And the only sealant in the system is an, the air seal on the inside. Rainwater is shed with, uh, by shingling materials. It's not shed by sealant, so no one will have to climb the seven story building to replace sealant at any time over the life of the building. We saved money on the steel. We didn't put relieving angles in the brick, seven stories unrelieved brick. The brick comes dry and it expands. The concrete block comes wet and it shrinks. So at the top floor, we had to allow for a half inch of deflection in all the uh, sheet me brick metal that we used to cover the edge of the insulation and the brick. There's nothing that in the 
brick face that where pigeons can roost. We designed it so that birds can't sit on the building and we designed it to be rodent proof and uh, roach proof. All right, how am I doing on time, Andy? Five minutes, five minutes. okay, that's good. Um, you make it so that <laughs> yeah, the, there's no hole bigger than about an eighth of an inch by an eighth of an inch. So you have to designate the layers that are going to do that. And if you want it to be durable and you have rodents in the neighborhood, then you have to have a rodent-proof layer. And that's a whole different talk, Ian. But and I would be delighted to talk to you about rats, bats, and roaches, or Jack Daniels at any time. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, avoiding condensation, notice that we did not trace the vapor barrier. We did not trace the vapor barrier because this wall or roof or below grade assembly has to work in heating and cooling conditions. If it was all heating condition, we'd put the vapor, bar a vapor barrier on the interior surface, we'd be done. If it was all cooling conditions, we put the vapor barrier on the exterior and we'd be done. We can't do that. We have to do it this way. One, make the assembly airtight so that air can't bypass your system. Number two, take all the materials that are low perm. That means you have to know the permeability of all the materials you're putting in your assembly because you don't want to get an accidental vapor barrier in the wrong place. You can do a wall that will dry to the interior and the exterior if you put it in the middle of two layers of mineral wool or fiberglass insulation. And that will work in most U.S. climates. You could put a frame wall with cellulose insulation in it, a sheathing making the air barrier and a vapor barrier, and then um, closed cell foam board on the outside, which puts a low permanent material in heating conditions that is warmed by all the insulation outboard of it, so that you are not going to have dew point in the middle of the wall in heating conditions. And you can put, and in cooling conditions, the low perm foam board has its exterior face to the outside, so you have a vapor barrier that's not going to see the air conditioned chilled material. See how that works? If you don't, that would be normal. If you don't actually get that right now, that would be normal. But someday when you have to think about it, this will come back to you. Andy asked me to talk about uh, air tightness of buildings. These are, uh, I don't know, 80 or so buildings that we've tested. These are all big commercial buildings. Um, and this is an, over here, this is an air leakage metric. Uh, how leaky is it? Normalized to each uh, square, one square foot of the building enclosure area. So it's just a metric. The bigger it is, the leakier the building is. Every one of these buildings from here, yeah, from about right here, these are all failed buildings. These are all forensic cases for me. Every freaking building. They're freezing pipes inside the thermal envelope. They're, they have horrible ice dams. They're growing mold inside their walls. They're all horribly failed. So wouldn't it be stupid to make buildings that leaky? So we should make them at least this tight. This is the, uh, the uh, um, International Building Code recommends this level. This is the Army Corps of Engineers. As we go tighter and tighter, we, we, I see fewer and fewer frequencies of those kinds of failed building enclosures. The tighter, the tighter they get. I still have some failed buildings over in this range. That's when all of the leaks happen to be in just the wrong spot. And I'm, I'm just about done, aren't I, Andy? Uh, I, I'm going to show you some quick, quick illustrations, photos of the field. This is the subliminal part of the talk. Overhangs, really good. 
tar paper, that's the overcoat. It's underneath the siding. Peel and stick membrane behind styrofoam. That's the insulation layer on top of the raincoat. Oops, somebody put the electrical penetration in the wrong spot and they moved it and our fluid applied raincoat is not covering that spot. Um, this is spray foam, it's doing all the jobs all in one application, but I had to stop them because they're spraying out of a wet wall and the, that will produce steam in the cells and break the cells and the foam will fall off. That would be bad. This is a, a fluid applied air barrier water based applied to wet block and so it doesn't cure because of the high pH of the block and the reaction with the latex binder and then so it slides down off the wall and never cures. That would be bad. You're starting to see what, where things can go wrong with this. Is it reminding you of biome? Flash the windows and now Andy's walking up here. Microclimates in buildings. See, I should have started here. That's a uh, bacteria colony. <laughs> that one will take too long to tell. This one I want to tell you about, and, and, and then, I'll, then I'll finish up, Andy. One, I'm in Central Florida. They can smell mold, but they can't find it. I'm walking down the corridor, an interior corridor. I see on the plexiglass cover over the fire alarm that there's condensation on the inside of the cover. Where, where's the mold? where the moisture is, it's inside the corridor wall. The corridor wall is depressurized by air leaks above the ceiling tile into the return air plenum. So the air handler is depressurizing the wall cavity and sucking central Florida air down the interior wall from the exterior wall, condensing inside the wall. It's snowing out in the other picture and the windows are open. That, that would be stupid, right? But people are smart, they're too hot on the top floor, so they open their windows, air goes out, making the people on the lower floor where the windows are closed and taped with duct tape, totally anticipating Homeland Security's recommendation. And <laughs> they're really cold. So that said, thank you, Andy. Um, there, you're gonna get to see these slides. If you go through them, a lot of them, you'll get by looking at them, they're little puzzles. So thanks so much.